Governments and industries engaged in net zero trajectories need to address fundamental questions right now. How to ensure that the massive investment wave is happening, um, to ensure that those raw materials and their refined products are going to be available when and where they need it. Um, in a manner that uh, both on the extraction side, both on the processing side, does not harm the environment, no the climate. In a matter also that guarantees that very strong, high um, social governments standards, so-called ESG standards, are being implemented. In a manner also that guarantees that local resource-rich countries see inclusive development through the extraction and through those value chains, um, in order not to reproduce the, some of the biggest mistakes that were done with the hydrocarbons in the past 20th century. And decisively, we also have to all work in order to address all the innovation issues related both to the extraction, both to the uh, processing industries, but also decisively to the recycling industries and further beyond the value chains to all the equipments, notably the battery cells, where new chemistries will enable to change or to alter the need for some specific raw materials and favour others that may be less critical. And basically what needs to happen is a whole new set of standards that are deployed and verified all across the world. Um, and this is exactly what this uh, new international minerals agency would need to work on. That agency would need to be based uh, within the OECD family because most of the OECD member countries are some of the world's largest import dependent countries on some of these resources. They also have some of the most advanced industries that use these resources and um, most of them actually have a potential also to produce some of and extract or refine some of these uh, raw materials and hence why uh, this could be embedded, this agency could be embedded within uh, the OECD family. So among its core functions, this new agency would assess resources, reserves, production capacities, actual production level on a monthly or yearly basis, uh, monitor stockpiles, trade, supply, future demand, Basically, what the US Geological Service is doing, what the IEA has been recently started doing for its flagship report on critical uh, resources, but also what, for example, the French, the German or the Japanese National uh, Geological Agencies do. A second aspect would be, of course, to conduct economic and technological scenarios and to see what would be the impact on different demand and supply or trade of some of those raw materials and, and how that would impact the different aspects of the value chains. That would include, of course, monitoring and understanding and, and projecting the future technology needs and their development, how innovation is being implemented, what is its potential, but also foster the strict implementation of these ESG standards that I was mentioning and notably the you know setting up some golden rules for sustainable and responsible mining and those golden rules for sustainable and responsible mining would be implemented all across the world and verified by this agency. There is also a couple of other aspects of course that all includes a, a strong dialogue with uh, a number of producing countries in the world, a number of consuming countries in the world, and those are very often countries that you hardly see in the international energy or resources governance. And that is, of course, very uh, important. And so there's a whole range of issues related to best practice sharing, to capacity building, notably on the recycling also um, segment of the value chain that will be addressed by this agency. So let's now talk about the institutional setting of this newly proposed international mineral or international raw materials agency. So there's three options on how exactly to set it up from an institutional point of view. There is a soft, flexible, yet effective one to start with. That could be within the International Energy Agency, which uh, would be given a mandate to work on these uh, raw materials, a dedicated budget, 
and the IEA would build on its existing analysis expertise, the one that it's recently shown in its latest report that was issued uh, a couple of months ago, and, and also its ability to work on new technologies and to include these into modeling through uh, its flagship ETP and WIO reports. So there's a lot of pros related to that. The IEA already exists. It's super efficient and legitimate. There's uh, room for many synergies across div different divisions of the IEA. The IEA ha has a number of uh, associate countries that are, of course, uh, key to be targeted by this uh, new agency, notably, of course, China, but Indonesia as well, Mexico, South Africa, um, to mention just a few. And, and of course, uh, uh, it uh, could become very quickly operational. Now, there is a couple of um, cons as well that need to be mentioned, effectively conducing these new tasks and responsibilities would require extremely uh, big new expertise actually still on some of the aspects, new resources and actually membership in this institutional setting would be still limited to the IEA constituency. And some uh, of those uh, tasks are already uh, were being worked on and covered by the OECD, notably those related to um, you know, sustainable uh, and, and responsible value chains. And obviously, there could be here some overlap. And lastly, several member countries or interested producing countries may not feel very comfortable with the current power balance uh, within the IEA. So there's another, a second option, which is uh, a kind of intermediary setting, which can also be temporarily and then further strengthened and developed uh, in the years to come. So basically the IEA would host a dedicated autonomous secretariat and, and work on securing responsible uh, raw materials. And that specific secretariat could be basically called in by the G7, notably, for example, next year, the G7 will be presided by Germany, a country that should be very interested by such a proposal, and actually would be funded uh, via specific budget lines, would have its dedicated staff, and could progressively start taking over these new responsibilities. And then there's a last option, which would uh, call for a much stronger institutional setting, and that would basically uh, be setting up a dedicated new international governance institution, which would be a separate uh, institution from the IEA, a separate one from the OECD, but actually uh, one that is still embedded within the OECD family on the model of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. And, and that could be established. Um, it will require, of course, governments to agree on that, to dedicate specific funding, etc., to that organization. But the advantage of having a, an agency that is modeled on the Nuclear Energy Agency is that you could have a number of countries that are not OECD members, but actually be part of it. For example, Russia is part of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, but is not part neither of the IEA nor of the OECD. In any case, that agency should be based in Paris, be part of the OECD family in order to be able also to, you know, benefit from all the synergies from the ecosystem that is based in Paris and that is working on the energy and, and climate issues uh, within the international governments. And of course, that new agency, whatever its exact setting is, would work very closely with a number of other international bodies, be they UN related, be they the World Bank, be they IRENA, be they the African Development Bank, be they of course the Asian Development Bank, and of course a, a number of private industry players from all across the world and the fundamental issue would be to reach out to all those countries that one hardly hears about in the global governments which is for example Peru, Bolivia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Gabon, Mauritania, Namibia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan to mention just a few.